Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Study IQ IAS English. My name is Bhuvana Purvajha and I am back with another edition of the Editorial Edge where we will take a look specifically at two topics today and only two topics because these two topics require attention from the point of the examination. Okay. So, this will be a brief session, not more than say 40-45 minutes but we will seek to understand these two topics in detail. All right. Shubhankar, good morning. Thanks for joining. Raghavendra, good morning. Thank you for joining. Thanks, thanks all of you for taking time out this early in the morning. Yes. Okay. So, these are the two topics that I have for you. So, a Minamata convention has been in the news because of the sixth anniversary since its adoption. All right. So, we'll seek to understand the Minamata convention and the problems associated with, say, mercury poisoning. Okay. And uh, uh, what what is the way forward? Okay. And, and say, when you look at Minamata convention and mercury poisoning, there is one particular sector that you need to be very careful of and that is uh, the gold mining sec uh, sector, the artisanal gold mining sector. So, we will take a look at uh, the sector, what is the problem, you know, why is it that the gold mining sector contributes so much to say mercury poisoning, alright. Thereafter, the second topic will be the autonomous bodies of MOEFCC, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Now, they had come up with a notification, the ministry, they had come up with a notification uh, merging certain bodies that uh, uh, were under it. Now, a notification or uh, the indications are that well, that merging will not happen. So, the decision has been reversed. So, from the examination perspective, I think it serves us best to know the merits of say going ahead and making uh, that kind of merging of those bodies and the merits of say the merging of those bodies. What's the, what's the better option? All right. Lekam, good morning, good morning. Purpose. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Okay. So, let's get started. If you want to, to connect with me, well, here is uh, my Instagram channel, okay. Uh, I have students uh, who connect with me regularly regarding their doubts, strategy problems, what kind of, say, books they should choose, what kind of reading material they should consult, what should be the way they should read an article. Some of the most basic questions are answered one-to-one. -one. So, if you have any particular doubts, I'd appreciate if you reach out to me. Go ahead and scan this. It will take you straight to my uh, Instagram channel and you can connect with me there, okay. And for one, whatever means answers or means questions that I often put forward in this uh, uh, series, Editorial Edge, well, the answers are to be sent on that particular email ID. Okay. Bulbul, Bul, thanks for joining. Good morning. Welcome again. All right. And uh, this is where you will find the PDF of this particular lecture. This will be uploaded on this Insta Telegram channel by, say, 12, 12.30. Okay. All right. Let's get started with the first topic. But before that, yes, the topics of yesterday. So, yesterday we had discussed uh, in detail the Solina channel and say, uh, what is the consequence, what is the challenge in so far as uh, for Ukraine, because again, they are seeking an alternative route for their uh, exports. So, uh, the questions that I had for you, Black Forest, Germany, this is the source of the river Danube, by the way. So, this is correct. Black Sea, Slovakia. Now, you have to understand that Black Sea has essentially six coastline states. Okay. It has just only six states. And if you want to note them down, well, they are in fact uh, Turkey. Bulgaria, Romania, all right, go ahead and write this down if you want to, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, it has six states, I have written one, two, three, four, what are the other two guys, can someone very quickly let me know what are the other two, obviously one will be Russia, because obviously you know their sixth fleet is stationed there, right, so Russia will be there. And what's the last one eventually that we're looking at is Georgia. Okay, good morning Pranjul, how are you? Welcome, welcome. So, these are the six states that you have that share a coastline with uh, the Black Sea. Unfortunately, Slovakia isn't one of them. So, this would be incorrect. And River Danube, Romania, yesterday we discussed the course of the River Danube originating in uh, the Black Forest of Germany. Thereafter, traverses one of the most international rivers in the whole world, traverses 10 countries and eventually the mouth of the river where it opens up, say, into the Black Sea merges, uh, diverges in fact into three particular channels of interest yesterday was uh, for uh, the Solina channel and so this is correct, okay. Danube does in fact pass through Romania. Ha! Sharath, thanks for uh, that, uh, that, that's a very good equation in fact. I should use that in my class. Thanks, thank you. Okay, so uh, the correctly matched here, one and three. All right, let's go forward. Six countries have coastlines with the Black Sea. Just now, I informed you of that. This is correct. The drainage basin of Black Sea is lesser than the number of coastline countries. Now, you have to understand this, that Black Sea is essentially fed by say, river systems that span 24 countries. Okay. 
whereas coastline states, coastline countries along the Black Sea are just six. So obviously, the drainage basin is much higher than the number of coastline countries, which means this is incorrect. And the primary rivers that drain into the Black Sea include Volga. Well, thankfully, most of you got this absolutely correct, that Volga does not uh, drain into the Black Sea. In fact, you find that it is only rivers Danube, Dnieper, such rivers that have been in the news recently and a host of other rivers that drain into the Black Sea. Okay. Once again, those of you who answered correctly, where does Volga uh, go ahead and drain into? Is it the Mediterranean or Caspian? Well, if you haven't answered so far, go ahead, make that distinction. Where does it go ahead and drain? Okay. So the incorrect statements here being 2 and 3. All right. All right. Finally, we discussed also uh, yesterday about uh, the whole uh, green standards for green hydrogen. Okay. And BEE is in fact the nodal agency that is responsible for the accreditation of agencies, BEE, an independent autonomous organization under the Ministry of Power. So these two are obviously correct. However, the emission standards that we see here, well, they are not being set by BEE. Like I told you in yesterday's discussion, at the moment, when you look at the institutional framework of green hydrogen in India, you're looking at two particular agencies, two particular organizations. One is obviously the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy and the other is Ministry of Power which is operating through BEE. So the standards being set by Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, now which has gone ahead and given the power to Ministry of uh, uh, Power, the BEE, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, to go ahead and frame the accreditation guidelines that will originate out of, say, green hydrogen standards. Okay, so this would obviously be incorrect, which means in this case, you are looking at statement three being incorrect. All right. So this was the brief recap of the questions that we had. Green hydrogen plant in Jorhat, correct? And brown, brown hydrogen, you have learned yesterday. Okay. The essential point is, brown hydrogen involves a process called gasification. Now, whenever you listen to the term gasification straight away, the informed will tell you that it is to do with coal. All right. So which means that non-renewable isn't used here. Okay. Because of the gasification process and obviously, the giveaway that the color brown, which means obviously some sort of unsustainability is added to it. So, which you find that it is only uh, based on, uh, sorry, it is only based on say uh, fossil fuels, say coal. So, this will be incorrect. Okay. So, the correct statement here being just one. All right. So, these individuals, Monica, BCT, Tanu, Pradeep, Puja, Asha, Mandeep, Evergreen, Akshay and Aditya, thank you for your participation. Uh, your answers, you have been correct. Most of the answers, probably one or two incorrect here or there, but that's fine. The most important part is you're taking part. You're learning. You're focusing on the outcome-based learning that the examination demands. Okay. So to the rest, again, I implore you like I do in every class. Go ahead and attempt the questions that I have for you today and see if it benefits you and your understanding. All right. Okay. We shall get started with the topics for the day now. So first, we'll take a look at Minamata Convention, which is what you find is a multilateral agreement. Okay. Between nations. And uh, what you find is it is specifically designed for one thing and one thing only. And the whole point of Minamata Convention, if you were to just go ahead and summarize it in one particular line, is to reduce the human element in mercury poisoning. Okay. This is the whole point of the convention. What you often, what in fact the history of this convention is that here in uh, the Bay of uh, uh, Minamata, in fact, the, in, in the Bay in Japan, in fact, you had a particular area. Now, that area was contaminated by industrial waste. Now, that industrial waste was consumed by the fish and the uh, shellfish in that area. Okay. Bioaccumulation happened, followed by biomagnification. Now, if these are completely new terms, don't worry, we'll discuss what they are. So after bioaccumulation and biomagnification, uh, magnification, what was found was that the people of the area, the Japanese people, they consumed that sort of particular poisonous fish laden with mercury. And thereafter, a decade-long problem erupted wherein many lost their lives, many were, say, incapacitated for life. So thereafter, this convention was adopted. And the whole focus of the convention was, let's go ahead and try and reduce the human causes behind, say, a uh, mercury poisoning. Now, mercury is a natural substance that you find in, uh, on, in the earth. 
But the point of the whole article is, the whole uh, information is that the focus of Minawata Convention is on reducing anthropogenic causes. All right. So let's look at it. The Minamata Convention on Mercury, a global treaty to protect the environment and the human health from the harmful effects of mercury. Okay. Now it's named after the Japanese city, Minamata, wherein this whole episode happened. So it is the youngest global multilateral environmental agreement. Here is a point for you. Okay. That I would suggest you take a note of from the examination perspective that as of now, as of 2023, it is in fact the youngest, the most recent multilateral agreement that is focused, that has got the collaboration of a host of countries, number of countries from across the world. Okay. It has entered into force in 2017. Since then, the convention has been ratified by 137 parties, India also a party to the Minamata convention. Let's go ahead and understand who are the parties here now. So 84% rate for the first full national report has been undertaken, which means countries have gone ahead and comprehensively evaluated their, say, contribution to mercury poisoning so far. A series of reports and meetings have been convened by uh, the Minamata, under the Minamata Convention. And, well, what is the whole point of this convention? Okay. Why is it that mercury poisoning is such a big issue? We will today understand the sectors that contribute the most to mercury poisoning. Okay. How is it that that particular, say, element enters into this biomagnification, bioaccumulation that we talk about? Okay. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the class, a lot has to do with gold mining, specifically the sector of artisanal gold mining. All right. So let's understand this now. Mercury. First, let's understand this. Mercury is a naturally occurring element, like I told you, found in the Earth's crust. Now, it is considered by the WHO as one of the top 10 chemicals or groups of chemicals of major public health concern. Okay. If you have to go ahead and look at the health effects that originate out of mercury poisoning, you find that the effects are profound. It, their effects are long lasting and the effect, the whole point of the thing is that it affects multiple parts of your body simultaneously. Okay. So exposure to mercury threatens a health with many often irreversible toxic effects. Developing fetuses and young children are most at, most at risk. Okay. Mercury pollution also harms wildlife and ecosystems. Straight away you understand that this is a linked problem. It is not just again by human health, but also about the larger ecosystem services that are at uh, uh, risk here. Okay. So let's understand the mercury cycle very quickly. What exactly is the mercury cycle? And you must have heard of say the hydrological cycle and many other cycles. Well, this is a simple cycle for you to understand. So you have mercury that is emitted to the atmosphere, sample the Minamata convention, the Minamata episode in fact. So you had industrial bodies that were going ahead and emitting a lot of pollutants, emis, uh, uh, emissions. All of that was getting transported into some sort of water body. Okay. Runoff was happening. So you have mercury that gets deposited in rain and snow as gases and particles. Thereafter, runoff happens, goes ahead and lodges itself in lakes, reservoirs. There, the uh, plant, the animals in fact, go ahead and use it. Okay. Using it and, and the whole point is that at this point you have methyl mercury that is created. As soon as methyl mercury, okay, this is the compound. So as soon you have, as soon as you have methyl mercury that is created and consumed by the fishes, now that has entered into the food system that we have, okay, and that eventually a lot of that gets accumulated in the fish. And eventually, once humans consume it, you find that it has entered straight away into the human food chain system. Okay. So here it is. You have that methyl mercury, which is now entered into the human food web, if you can uh, say, categorize it as such. And then as soon as it enters the human food web, the food web of which we are a part of, you find that it gets entered into our systems. Eventually, you have compounding effect in sort of the poisoning that takes place. And thus, you find that profound effects in the human health of a person. All right. So this, mer this mercury cycle is very important for us to understand the two processes that this uh, mercury poisoning uh, comprises. Number one is bioaccumulation. Number two is biomagnification. All right. I suggest you make a note of that. Now let's look at the number one source that uh, most research says in terms of say mercury poisoning. Okay. And extremely important from the examination perspective, specifically the pre. I would suggest you take a note of this. Okay. So what do you find? Globally, artisanal and small-scale gold mining 
is the largest source of anthropogenic mercury emissions. In fact, 37.7%. The creation of mercury amalgams, all right, mercury gold amalgams is the problem. Now, look at this figure here. What you find is that elemental mercury, you are using Hg to go ahead and extract gold, okay. From the ore, you are using Hg to go ahead and extract gold and look at the person who is handling it, okay. This is isolated without any gloves, without any way of say uh, hum human health protection at all, okay. Often what you find is to do this extraction, it is one individual who is doing it barehanded and therein you have it. Straight away as soon as you touch it with a bare hand, you are looking at some sort of deposition that happens on the human skin some sort of absorption that takes place in the human body. Eventually, this process is straight away the, the entry point in so far as again mercury's entry into the human systems is concerned. This in itself contributes to more than 40% of mercury poisoning across the world. Okay. Dipanshi, good morning. Thanks for joining. Thanks for joining. Okay. So, are you able to get this first? That the creation, the burning of mercury gold amalgam and this whole process is why? so that you are going to go ahead and extract gold from the ore. Bear in mind, now this is not being done in an industrial manner. So, there is an industrial manner of extraction of gold. That does not involve this risk. You are looking at the small scale, uh, say, uh, gold miners, gold artisans, workers who engage in this process and thus are, uh, say, exposed to mercury poisoning. Now, what would be the way around this way? What would you do to, say, go ahead and address this? One way is that go ahead and say give them the adequate security and say protective gear, that would be one. Second is to go ahead and try and capture the mercury at the source, okay. This would be other method that we will just take a look at. That how you try and go ahead and say isolate the mercury right at the very source so as to uh, say reduce the chances of mercury poisoning of this particular individual, alright. So, suggest take a note of this again. What is the process exactly, okay. So, let us look at the major sectors first. Like I told you, number one, artisanal and small scale mining, primarily of gold is what you are looking at, okay. Thereafter, stationary combustion of coal, non-ferrous metal productions, cement productions, waste from products, host of them. However, I suggest that you take a note of the first three, okay. And primarily, try to understand and link Minamata Convention, mercury poisoning with the artisanal gold mining and gold industry. I think these three should be coming in a natural flow for you, okay. Not just say for the prelims, but also for the mains. Eventually, any answer on say mercury poisoning must compulsorily include at least a paragraph on Minamata Convention and thereafter explaining the causes say of mercury poisoning, you should absolutely talk about say the artisanal and small scale mining of gold, alright. So, I suggest you use this chart to basically flow chart your answer in a way, okay. Let us go forward and take a look at the mercury poisoning. How do, does it affect an individual? So, like I told you, the effects are profound, okay, varied throughout the body. There is not a single element of your body that is going to be unaffected by it, okay. Nervous system, emotional instability, insomnia, tremors, memory loss, you are going to expect that. You are looking at your motor system getting affected. Paralysis is often considered to be a precursor to coma and eventually the death of an individual who suffers from uh, mercury poisoning, okay. Your immune system fails, renal system, kidney is failing, reproductive system harmed, alright. So, once again, make a note of the systems that are harmed straight away by say as a result of Minamata disease or mercury poisoning, okay. Kalyan, I agree, I have, I have, I have read about it, the mercury spill management. This is, this is why it's even in industrial systems, you have mercury that is used. It's not a, it's not a, say a, a, an element that is not used. However, there is a way and a method to use that in a say a safe and secure manner and what the what the photo just you saw right now this evidently does not look like a very safe and secure method to deal with uh, compounds such as mercury right so i absolutely agree with you there but the problem is that because again this is this, this is an unorganized sector okay how do you go ahead and enforce all of this protective gear eventually that's going to cost money so who's going to provide it because you can't expect these individuals to say invest money buy expensive protective gear Eventually, you are going to need, say, institutional support from the government to go ahead and, uh, say, help this particular sector, help this particular set of individuals, okay. And hospital can afford to do that because, let's not forget, they have the finances. But here, that problem does arise, correct? Correct, Shubhankar, that's a fair observation. Chandrabhan, good morning, good morning. 
All right. So now the way forward, let's look at this very quickly. This you are going to use in your main answers. Okay. Because again, the Mina Mata Convention's sixth anniversary has been observed. So it makes sense to study for, say, the 2023 means. Okay. This would be a, a question that an aware candidate should ideally prepare for. And so the way forward in terms of mercury poisoning. So what you're going to do is look at reducing the near-term significant emissions. And how do you do that? If mercury is captured during the amalgam burns, when you go ahead and make the mercury gold amalgam, okay? When you go ahead and make the mercury gold amalgam, you are trying to go ahead and capture the mercury emissions therein, okay? You're going to try and capture the mercury emissions at the very source. If you're able to do that, a large amount of the risk can be, say, uh, brought down. Okay. Number two, phytoremediation. Now, another term that you must be aware of. Please be aware in this particular lecture, in this particular uh, short discussion, we have discussed already two particular uh, processes. One is bioaccumulation and one is biomagnification. Okay. Now, the thir third one that I'm introducing you to is uh, phytoremediation. What you're looking at is allowing plants to absorb and accumulate mercury from soil, water or sediments, which can be then harvested and safely disposed of. So, you're going to use the plants as a conduit. Okay. You're going to use them as a storage facility for, say, the poisonous mercury. That process would be known as phytoremediation. Okay. And finally, you're looking at the Planet Gold Program that is being uh, led by the United Nations Environment Program, okay, which seeks to eliminate mercury from the artisanal gold mining, the very sector that we discussed right now, the artisanal gold mining sector. Okay. We are looking at the UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, with the Planet Gold Program, you know, looking specifically at this particular sector that we discussed. Okay. What the whole point of the sector is, again, to create safer working conditions. You know, just like I informed you, you are not going to have, say, you dig this sector, this set of people, the artisanal gold miners, they are going to require support, hand holding. Okay, they can't be expected to bring in the reforms themselves. If they were capable, they would have done so. Yes, clearly there is a lack of, say, financial incentive or, say, resources, which needs to be provided by, say, institutions like the UNEP or state governments, national governments. Vaishnavi, that's a fair uh, 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 analogy. Correct. Correct. Deepan, shall answer your question. I'll answer your question. Can we just bring it to the end of the discussion? I'll definitely answer your question. Theke? Okay. So that completes uh, the Meena Mata Convention. Go ahead and quickly answer this question for me in the comment box. This is a question from UPSC 2010, I believe. Yes, 2010. Okay. UPSC asking a question on uh, fluorescent lamps and mercury. So go ahead and answer this question. What I what you're going to do is I have say five questions for you, A to E. Answer them in the comment box in a logical sequential manner. And the right answers, those who get all correct, they'll find their names getting figured tomorrow morning at 6.30. Okay. So here's the question. Indiscriminate disposal of used fluorescent electric lamps causes mercury pollution in the environment. Why is mercury used in the manufacture of these lamps? What makes mercury absolutely indispensable? in the manufacture of these fluorescent electrical lamps. Why is it that they are used? Okay, you are going to go ahead and answer this. Next, which of the above are symptoms of mercury poisoning? I have given you the whole slide. You know that it affects, say, the motor system, the nervous system, the reproductive system. All of that, are, the effects are, like I told you, are wide and wi uh, far and wide. So you go ahead and answer this question for me. Loss of memory, lack of voluntary muscle movements, Loss of peripheral vision paralysis. Okay. Next. So, uh, very quick announcement, guys, before I move forward. This closes, the admission for this closes tomorrow, the prelims to interview initiative. Okay. Uh, we have a batch that started on the 11th and uh, we had started with geography. I'm personally involved with that particular batch. And you'll be surprised to know that we have made excellent progress in so far as, say, the initial part of physical geography is concerned. Okay. And, and the focus is on holistic, complete understanding rather than just say mere repetition of what is written in the books. Okay. The focus is on giving you the practical application of concepts so that you're able to relate in the larger web of understanding that is required for UPSC. Okay. So if that is something that you're interested in, go ahead and sign up for this. You will find the sign up link in the description box. And when you do go ahead and sign up for this, bear in mind that you have three languages that you can choose your course in. Number one is English, number two is Hindi, and number three is bilingual. 
where the faculty goes and say teaches you in a mixture of Hindi and English. The notes to be provided for that in English. Okay. And uh, when you go ahead and sign up for this, use the code BA Live, this particular code. Why? Well, if you like my method of teaching, if you can correlate and understand the method and the way I want to communicate, well, that gives me the opportunity to be a part of your batch. Okay. And obviously, more than that, you get a very good discount. So, this is uh, closing tomorrow. In fact, uh, 6 p.m. is when the links go dead. I suggest you go ahead and make haste. All right. Sandhya, good morning. Uh, no, Shubhankar, that'll be different. That'll be different. That'll be different. Okay? okay, let's go forward. Next, and the second topic that I have for you. Now, look at this. This particular notification was released uh, by the MOEFCC. Okay, back in uh, June. All right, what does the notification say? Constitution of regional offices and their sub offices of the Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. And what were the offices and regional sub offices of these particular organizations? The FSI the NTCA, okay, the WCB and the CZA. Now, uh, first, the scope of this discussion. First, we are going to look at, say, the merits plus the demerits of such a proposal. Okay, I think this would be under, uh, like expected to understand from us. And number two is we are going to look at each of these bodies separately. Okay, so as to understand, well, what's the scope, what's the ambit of the responsibilities? Okay, so that's going to be the ambit of this short discussion, 15 to 20 minutes, not more. Let's go ahead. Okay, so this notification was released and the ministry explained it as a decision for ease of doing business. Obviously, the point was that well, it will lead to better coordination, okay, better access to resources, pooling of resources, manpower, all of that will be uh, under an umbrella system. So that was the whole point of the notification that was released by the government. However, then it came under, say, immense criticism from certain sections, say, the activists and those who are associated with this environment and forest conservation in India. And the problems that they raised, the, con the, the objections that were raised, primarily were to do with the dilution of the scope and ambit of responsibilities of each and every body. Okay. Then again, in the middle, you must have heard that Project Elephant and Project Tiger, they were also supposed to be merged together that they would also be again rationalized under the same uh, say logic that you're looking at say access of resources, common resources, division of say uh, responsibilities, better coordination, all of that was again uh, justified to uh, uh, go ahead and engage in uh, the management, the merger of Project Elephant and Project Tiger. Okay, so let's look at this. The problem that was raised by the activists that because of this notification where you are going to go ahead and merge these particular bodies, the Forest Survey of India, National Tiger Conservation Authority, Wildlife Crime Control Bureau and the Central Zoo Authority. Okay. Because of this, what you are essentially looking to do is what the activists said, that the bodies will be rendered toothless. And that's a very fair criticism. Okay. So let's look at the example. In the existing structure, the NTCA can oppose a forest clearance for an infrastructure project for diverting tiger reserve areas. Let's not forget that NTCA is the primary body when it comes to tiger conservation in India. Okay, It is the primary body when it comes to tiger conservation in India. Very quickly, someone in the chat let me know who is the chairperson of the NTCA, the National Tiger Conservation Authority. Your options, Prime Minister, the Environment Minister, President of India, none of the above. Batai mujhe very quickly. Okay, so what you're finding is that the NTCA can oppose in the present scenario if, say, you find tiger sanctuary or tiger reserve land getting diverted. However, the proposed merger would have rendered this difficult as the NTCA would then report to the Inspector General of Forests, who is in charge of the integrated regional office and reports to the ministry. So, thus, the autonomy part, the criticism is that the autonomy part of these particular organizations will be severely hit. Okay. And that's a very fair criticism that you find that the decision making of individual bodies will be hindered because again, they'll be reporting to one particular ministry and conservation, you know, requires autonomy for the organizations so as to take decisions from the point of view of conservation, from the point of view of animal benefit, from the point of view of reducing man-animal conflict. Okay, so that was a fair criticism. Concerns were also raised over the recent plan to merge Project Tiger and Project Elephant this was also in the offing, potentially affecting the autonomy and importance of these initiatives. Correct? Good. Environment Minister, those who have mentioned is correct. Absolutely. Bipen, good answer. 
Shubankar, good answer. Badia, badia. Well done. Okay. So the criticisms now from the mains perspective, if you were to go ahead and if you are given an answer on say the institutional framework that is required for say forest conservation or environment conservation in India and say throw light on the recent events, if that is what the question is hinting at, then well you have to talk about these particular issues that reducing the autonomy of these particular bodies, creating administrative confusion and chaos, right? Because again, right now you have clearly demarcated responsibilities that yes, NTCA, such and such. Central Zoo Authority, you are going to go ahead and say, uh, engage in the management of stud books. Okay, what are stud books? Very quickly, those who are watching. What are stud books when it comes to conservation in India? See, this is what the examination will ask you to do, you know. The days of uh, simple questions getting asked that what was Rio 92, all of that is over. They are going to ask you absolutely simple focused questions that you ought to know, okay. So, I'll tell you very briefly what are stud books, okay. Make a note of this if you are listening to it for the first time. For example, I have two particular specimen in my zoo, say specimen A and specimen B, right. Now, obviously, they, are, they have say parents, they, ha they are a progeny of their father and mother. So, the stud book is essentially going to maintain the genetic chronology of a particular say a, a, a lineage. Why? So that this intermixing does not happen. You know by now that intermixing of near genes leads to say uh, uh, deformations, you know mutations. It leads to weaker offspring. Don't you know that? That if say A and B, yes, together they go ahead produce C, right? Now they also go ahead and say produce D. Eventually, if C and D mate, E whatever comes out is going to be so much more weaker than say A and B. This problem is avoided by maintaining stud books so that those who are genetically linked do not mate. Because the moment they mate, this offspring that comes out is weaker, which means you are going to threaten your own conservation because you did not care enough to maintain a genetic logbook. Got it? So a stud book is the genetic logbook, logbook of all the species that you have in say your zoo. Okay, it's maintained across all Indian zoos. Okay, make a note of this please. So, it creates administrative confusion and chaos. Now, who goes ahead and creates the stud book? Does Caesar Day do it? Huh? Who, who is the primary authority if you have gone ahead and merged? Please understand the problems that originate on the ground. Right now, you know who is your reporting boss, you know your, who is your reporting authority, what's the focus of your responsibility. After the merging, there is going to be a period of transition, good six to eight months. So, would processes like these get hampered? Probably. Yes. So, again, a criticism that is being launched. All right. Dilution of institutional framework, blow to conservation, again, all linked, but essentially to do with the organizations. Because let's understand this very clearly, that institutions that are managing specific sectors of conservation need to be empowered if the species that they seek to conserve has to be conserved. Correct? Deepanshi, absolutely. Interbreeding depression is absolutely correct. Okay. All right, so let's look at the, the bodies now because uh, this conversation would be absolutely incomplete if we did not seek to understand the bodies. So now this is where your preparation for pre begins. The first two slides, more for the mains perspective, giving you the holistic overview of the topic. Let's look at the pre perspective now. The FSI, based in the picturesque Dehradun, not very far from where you all seek to go, LBSNAA, all right, which is in Masuri, by the way. So it is responsible for conducting forest surveys, assessments, and related research. And most important, it goes ahead and publishes the India State of Forest Report, the ISFR. It's a biennial report published by the Forest Survey of India. Okay. And it goes ahead and gives you the entire comprehensive overview plus specific details of the state of forests, including say what are the challenges that they face, what are the opportunities, what has been the progress, what has been the downfall, all of that is chronicled and locked down in the India State of Forest Report that is published by the FSI Dehradun. Okay, all right. Kalyan, uh, what you are uh, alluding to, no, Liger, essentially is uh, interbreeding what you are happening. Okay, stud book is not about interbreeding. It is about maintaining, say, the same breed. Okay, progeny should be of the same breed, but then they should not be genetically linked. It's like, say, uh, ma marrying a closely linked relative. You know, it's going to have effects in the progeny that comes out. The stud book seeks to avoid that. Okay. Now let's look at NTCA. 
National Tiger Conservation Authority. Make a note of this. This has been in the news. For the right or the wrong reasons, it has been in the news. So, NTCA set up in 2005 under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, specifically for the conservation of tigers. Okay. Responsible for managing Project Tiger are in India's tiger reserves. How many tiger reserves are there in India, guys? Which state has the highest number of tiger reserves in India? Very quickly, I'll give you the options. Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, West Bengal, Assam, Tamil Nadu. Go ahead, let me know which state has the highest number of tiger reserves in India. So, the minister MOEFCC, as all of you who rightly pointed out, those who answered in the comment box, that yes, minister MOEFCC is in fact the uh, chairperson, the chair of the National Tiger Conservation Authority. Okay. You also find that the NTC also has independent MP representations from both the houses of parliament. Okay. From the Lok Sabha as well as the Rajya Sabha. Okay. So, what you find is essentially the number is 3 and 2. Okay. Both LS and RS participation on the NTCA board. All right. And then we look at the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. Now, you understand that sites, okay, where you are looking at, say, this particular sites. For those of you who do not know, this goes ahead and bars trade in, say, protected species. Okay. Now, can you go ahead and, say, bar trade in protected species? Say, suppose, Olive Ridley turtles. If you are a custom officer, would you have a particular idea of what are Olive Ridley turtles and how are they different from, say, normal turtles? Which means the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau goes ahead and assists the customs, assists the agencies, the enforcement agencies in terms of, say, export-import, in, uh, in identifying management, conservation, protection of these endangered species. Okay? Correct. Okay. I have conflicting answers, but okay. Fair enough. Look, tell me that, see, in terms of tiger population, no two things. Number one, uh, not the number of tiger reserves. That keeps fluctuating. You have, say, uh, the uh, tiger reserve that is getting to go get notified in Goa, the Madhe Tiger Reserve. Okay. Wildlife Sanctuary is being proposed. We had done a session on this. that The Madhe Tiger Reserve is going to be notified. So, the number of tiger reserves keeps varying. Don't worry about that. To worry about two things. Number one, tiger, uh, tiger population. Number two, tiger density. Number three, tiger corridors. Be very clear of these three things. If you are clear of these three things, your tiger is done in India. Okay. All right. So, Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, statutory multidisciplinary body. Again, Wildlife Protection Act 1972. It goes ahead and combats organized wildlife crime. Your olive ridley turtles, your red pandas, your snow leopards, your tigers, rhinoceros horns, all of that need protection. And the custom officers can't be, uh, say, asked or expected to do it. So, you have this particular agency that goes and coordinates all of those actions. Okay. Advices in inspection of the consignments of flora and fauna as per the provisions of the Wildlife Protection Act, sites and export import policy. Right. So, you're going to make sure that this particular body is the coordinating agency when it comes to export import of protected species. Finally, the Central Zoo Authority, an organization that we have taken a very extensive look at in this series uh, over the last, say, two, three months. Okay. The Central Zoo Authority is the coordinating agency for all zoos and aquariums in India. Bear in mind, I also use the word aquariums. Okay. Zoos and aquariums are managed by the Central Zoo Authority and they, in fact, uh, are a part of the WAZA, WAZA, World Aquarium and Zoo Authority. Okay. So, in fact, that's the governing body. That's, they say, the multi, uh, uh, the national body that you have, the multilateral body, the WAZA. And what, do, what does uh, the Central Zoo Authority do besides maintaining stud books? It goes ahead and, well, it regulates the exchange of animals of endangered category between zoos. Okay. So, you would often find, say, a particular rhinoceros, white rhinoceros getting transferred from, say, Guwahati Zoo to Nandan Kanan Zoo. Okay. So, obviously, who is the decision-making body here? The NTCA can't do it. No. Okay. The ministry shouldn't do it because, again, they are a policy-making body. That's not their job. So, you have the Central Zoo Authority operates under the ministry that will regulate, say, the transfer of endangered animals between zoos in India. Okay. So, for example, snow leopard. Which are the zoos that operate or say have snow leopard in India? I'll give you options. Okay. So, for example, snow leopard conservation. Which particular zoo is responsible for snow leopard conservation and red panda conservation? Two animals that you should be absolutely aware of when it comes to zoos in India. Okay. I'll give you the answers to this. In fact, the question today also is focused on this only. So, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. 
<coughs> so it's a statutory body regulating and monitoring the functioning of zoos. Again, Minister MOEFCC, like the chairperson of NTCA, is also the chairperson of the Central Zoo Authority. Make a note of this, please. Okay. Now let's look at the questions that I have for you. Which of the above is or are incorrectly matched? Number one, Padmaja Naidu Himalayan Zoological Park in Darjeeling. Sanjay Gandhi Biological Park in Patna. Sri Chamarajendra Zoological Park Garden in Mysuru. And Nawab Wajid Ali Shah Zoological Garden in Hyderabad. Well, you know what? This question you can straight away answer if you know your history. Okay. If you know your history, you don't even need to worry about uh, the environment in this. So anyways, which of the above are incorrectly matched? You will let me know in the uh, answer box, the comment box. And D, among the following tiger reserves, which one has the largest area under critical tiger habitat? Now, this was asked by the uh, UPSC just a couple of years ago. Okay. So this is what we do here. Yes, uh, we look at topics. Then after we seek to understand the topics from mains and pre perspective. 40, 45, 50 odd minutes, two topics, done threadbare along with PYQs. Okay, that is the whole focus. So go ahead and answer this question for me. And with that, my dear students, my dear lovelies, we come to the end of this morning session that I had for you. Two short topics, two brief topics, but done threadbare. I hope you will consider answering uh, the questions that I have for you in the comment box. Okay, and if you have any particular suggestions for me, any particular feedback, criticism, appreciation, whatever it be, go ahead, reach out to me either on my email ID or on the uh, comment box below. I'd most appreciate it. Okay. On that note, have a very productive day. Study well, study hard till I see you tomorrow morning 6.30 am with another set of topics in the editorial edge. It's a wrap from Bhuvanapur Vajha. Thanks for watching. Bye.